Hello everyone and welcome to today's CPD professional subject knowledge webinar for the science T level and the focus for today is the delivery of biological molecules. The plan for today's session is just to begin with some quick introductions first then we're going to have a brief overview of the T level qualification then we'll look at the biological molecules proteins protein structure and enzymes, then carbohydrates and lipids, and nucleic acids. Uh, please do ask questions throughout this webinar as well. We will address questions at the end, but we will also be stopping at various points throughout this webinar to address any questions that you may have. This session is also going to be recorded, and you can actually access the slides being used today from the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. But first, I'd like to begin with just a little poll to gauge your current confidence with the delivery of biological molecules. So with a one being little to no confidence and a 10 being very confident. So you should see that poll on your screen now. So if you just choose whereabouts you think you are. Okay, I'll close it off now. It's very much a mixed bag. Um, it's actually an even split though, with some at the very, very lower end. So 50% of you, half of you here is one to two, and the other half up very much higher at the seven to eight sort of area. Well, hopefully we'll be able to uh, help you today, make you feel a bit more confident with the delivery of this content. So I'll just close off that poll. and begin, as I mentioned, just with those few quick introductions. So my name is David Kiernan, and I work in the provider development team at NCFE. And I support centers with the delivery of our qualifications, the structure, the assessments, and anything related to teaching and learning. And my direct email is shown on screen now, but if I'm unavailable, then do please use our general provider development email address. And I'm also joined today by Joe, uh, and I'll let Joe introduce himself there as well. Thanks, David. So hello, everyone. My name is Joe Neem, and I'm the science subject specialist here at the NCFE, meaning I support with science queries across the business and our various qualifications. I also support with the delivery of the T-level in science, the structure, and anything related to teaching and learning. My direct email address is also shown there. And back over to you, David. Excellent, thanks, Joe. And one other thing, uh, we are also collaborating with STEM Learning for the Science T level, and we will be working closely with them, but in particular with Chris Carr, who is the Network Education Lead. So some webinars, such as this one on biological molecules, will have further sessions developed and delivered by STEM Learning. For example, some other topics include physics concepts, a prep to teach sessions, math competencies, etc. Now the link is shown there for STEM Learning's main T-level page. And on there you will find the upcoming CPD sessions, but there's also other support material there, including teaching resources for section A, section B, and also for general math competencies. So we're going to begin just with a brief overview of the T-level and the assessments therein. For more comprehensive information, do please see one of our onboarding webinars. So to begin with, just what is a T-level? They are a level three, two-year program aimed at 16 to 19 year olds, an equivalent in size, depth and rigor to three A-levels and do also attract UCAS points. They are owned by the Institute for Apprenticeship and Technical Education or IFAT and the design and content for the T-levels came directly from employer panels in the relevant industries. And because of these employer panels, T-levels do offer students a route into paid employment. And as UCAS points are also available, students can progress onto higher education or onto a higher level apprenticeship. And the entire design of the T-levels is to ensure students have the threshold competency for the relevant occupational role. And that's probably the most important aspect really, ensuring students have that threshold competency. The specification can be divided into two sections. 
the core component and the occupational specialism content. The core content is further divided into three sections. Section A, which is about working in the health and science sector. Section B, which is the scientific knowledge, concepts and understanding of biology, chemistry and physics. And the core skills. And this core content and the skills form the foundations that the occupational specialism content and skills is built upon. Now, some of this core content is also called root core content, meaning that it's actually going to be common to the health, science, and healthcare science T levels. Section A root content are those four elements specifically on screen there. And all of B1 is root content too. Then we have the content and knowledge and skills specific for the occupational role. And these are the occupational specialisms that are currently live. The content, knowledge and skills will be different from one specialism to another, because again, it's all about having the threshold competency for that job role. Now, there's one other part of the technical qualification I want to highlight, which is the general competency framework. And this lists the English, maths and digital skills competencies that students will also be taught. Because again, the focus is for students to have that threshold competency for the job role. Now these competencies are assessed, but they're also embedded within the specification. But it would be useful to develop these further with your students. And as for the T-level assessments, they can be broken down into the core assessments and the occupational specialism assessments. So the core assessments, consists of two written exam papers covering the core content in section A and section B, and an externally set skills assessment called an employer set project. It's called this as the tasks had input from employers to make them as realistic as possible. The occupational specialism, which is assessed in year two, and it's assessed via externally set synoptic assignments. These are also designed to be as occupationally realistic as possible. So I'm now going to hand over to Joe, our subject specialist, who's going to go through the biological molecules content. Thanks, David. Hello again, everyone. So we're going to be looking at where biological molecules feature within the specification. We'll be focusing on core component B content, but we will touch upon where they feature in occupational specialisms as well. Specifically, we are going to be looking at the content, the depth of the content, delivery ideas, and answering any questions that you may have. Throughout the session, there will be a Padlet open for you to refer to the biological molecules content that we will be covering. This will allow you to add any comments or ideas that you may have with the initial biological molecules planning and delivery. It can also be updated with any ideas that may pop up throughout the session to ensure, to ensure we are sharing that good practice. There is also a section for any general concerns that will help us with future support and planning. Please be aware though that this is just the general concerns around any other specification, specification sections that you may have and want covered in the future. Any questions that you have specific to this webinar and its content, please make sure you pop into the question box. And the link for the uh, Padlet will now be going into the chat box. And I'm, we're just gonna give you 30 seconds to have a go at accessing that. That's brilliant and please do let us know if you have any problems accessing that in the chat. So the first time we come across proteins is within B1.7, which covers the relationship between the structure, properties and functions of proteins. Now in terms of interpreting the specification, the point in bold is the overarching learning point that the students must understand and then any subsequent bullet points or sub bullet points provide the depth that, that the students need to know. In terms of the depth for this bullet point, you'll need to cover the definition of an amino acid, the general structure. You also need to make students aware that there are 20 different amino acids, each with a different side chain. It then goes on to describe how dipeptides are formed and then the two types of proteins, functional and globular proteins. Now, this learning will be built upon within B2, so it's important to consider how you want to deliver this. You may wish to cover this content just on its own or you may wish to do it alongside the B2 learning. 
It may be that you are covering this with a combined group of health, healthcare science and science students, as this is core, con core content. And so you can only cover the B1 content. And so we'll look at how you could deliver this content next. So to help students understand, I would start with an introduction of the structure of amino acids, using that language that they are the monomers that make up proteins. You could also build upon this by explaining that monomers are the repeating molecules within large chains that make up many organic molecules. This will then be applied to polypeptide structure later on. I would also show them the structure just to help them better understand what is meant by the amine group, carboxyl group and side chain. Showing the structure also helps them to understand what is meant by the different R groups and students don't need to be aware of those 20 different specific R groups that make up the 20 different amino acids, but just showing them a couple of examples will help that understanding. Um, and again, will help contextualize that specification point so that they are clear what is different about each amino acid. I've included glycine and alanine as an example, but you could obviously choose whichever you wanted to, just again, to help offer that context to that learning. Now, the specification does not require condensation to be covered in detail, but it is just referenced in relation to the formation of a dipeptide in this example. However, as condensation comes up again in other contexts later on, I would personally include what happens in a condensation reaction just to help students better understand that reaction process. In terms of defining a condensation reaction for any laboratory sciences, occupational specialism students, there is a definition provided within that specialism, which is it's a type of polymerization where a polymer is made by producing a small molecule as a byproduct. And we know in this example, it would be water. Again, this is not required. However, I would include how that water molecule is formed, as well as highlighting the peptide bond, just again to help students understand, understand that formation of a dipeptide. This would be personal preference and is not required by the specification. Finally, in terms of the B1 content, now that students have covered the structure of an amino acid and that condensation reaction, they can then apply this to the formation of a polypeptide. They'll be able to understand that when hundreds of amino acids join together through those condensation reactions, it forms a polypeptide, which can then be represented in a simplified diagram like that on the screen. In terms of B1, they just have to know that multiple polypeptide chains form proteins that can be divided into those two groups, fibrous and globular. These different polypeptide chains then determine the shape, size and function of that protein. However, this will be built upon within B2. And here we can see how B2 then goes into more detail within B2.1 the molecular structures and functions of the following and in this section proteins carbohydrates and lipids are included so we'll be looking at how the carbohydrates and lipids content is also built upon but that will be later on in the webinar for proteins we are provided with more depth around the roles of the different bonds within proteins the relationship between primary secondary tertiary and quaternary structure of proteins and then more information about the difference between globular and fibrous proteins. In the next few slides, we're going to explore how we could deliver this level of detail. Now, despite the order in this specification, I would start with the relationship between primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure within proteins. This is because I will believe it will help students better understand the role of hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and disulfide bridges within the structure. So starting with the primary structure, which is quite simply the sequence of amino acids within that polypeptide, and that links nicely into learning around genetics as codons will also be covered within B2. So you could potentially link this by talking about how the specific sequence of codons then code for the specific sequence of amino acids within the polypeptide. Then in terms of the secondary structure, hydrogen bonds cause that polypeptide to twist into a 3D shape, such as an alpha helix or beta sheet. 
then the tertiary structure is that further twisting of that 3D shape of the polypeptide into a more complex structure. And building back in the learning from B1, this is where the side chains play an important role. As disulfide bridges, bridges are mentioned, you could cover cysteine as an example, as it contains sulfur in its R group. And that is what allows the formation of those disulfide bridges, forming those strong connections between sections of the polypeptide. And then finally, quaternary structure is a number of interacting polypeptides forming a large protein. Now that isn't detailed within the specification, but that is the level of detail again I would personally go into just to allow students to fully understand the relationship between those levels of structure and how they then would link to protein properties and function. And here is just an example of some diagrams you could use to support that information on the previous slide. So again, making clear that the primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. Then we have the secondary structure, which is the folding of that primary structure due to hydrogen bonds. Then the tertiary structure is that further twisting of the 3D shape due to hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and disulfide bridges that form between the R side chains of the amino acids. And then finally, the quaternary structure when multiple polypeptides come together to make that protein. In terms of the level of uh, depth around types of bond, the specification again just refers to their role within protein structure. So like we did in the previous slide, you could just talk about them in terms of their role in the formation of the secondary and tertiary structure of the polypeptide. However, you may wish to define each bond if you want to better support that understanding, but again, it's not specifically required here. It is good to be aware that ionic and covalent bonds do feature in the GCSE Com Combined Science Foundation curriculum, but if you wanted guidance on how you could define those two types of bond, they feature with it again within the laboratory sciences occupational specialism. So in the case of the specialism, ionic bonding involves the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions formed by the transfer of one or more electrons from a metal to non-metal. And then covalent bonding involves the sharing of electron pairs. For globular proteins, the specification refers to them as proteins which are formed from long change, which are arranged in a variety of coiled shapes. It then goes on to reference how this diversity of shapes reflects the range of functions performed by these proteins, such as binding, signaling, and transport. The two examples it gives are enzymes and haemoglobin, and I'm just showing haemoglobin on the screen here as enzymes are covered within more detail within B2. So you could make reference to the function of haemoglobin in its role in binding and transporting oxygen. And you can also use it as an example in terms of talking about primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure. That isn't required. However, it may help lend some context to the information that will have already been covered. And then in terms of fibrous proteins, the specification refers to them as proteins which are formed from long chains, which run parallel, linked by cross bridges and form stable molecules to act as structural polymers. It gives collagen as an example, which I've included a very simplified diagram of on the screen. Again, not required, but you could reference its role within the connective tissue within the body, just as context, context to prove its role as a structural protein. Now, before we move on to enzymes, I'm just going to ask David to check if there's any questions in the chat that have come up and will answer for you. No questions uh, so far about any of that, Joe. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, do uh, put them in throughout any questions that come up. Brilliant. Thanks, David. So as mentioned, globular proteins references enzymes, and this is expanded upon in B2 as seen on the screen here. You can also see why it's important to cover the protein content first, as it gives students that understanding of the tertiary structure that can then be linked to the shape of the active site, the role of bonding, and the effect of pH and temperature. It then goes on to reference the mechanism of action that allows enzymes to catalyze intracellular reactions. Included in this is the lock and key hypothesis, the effect of enzyme and substrate concentration, and the induced bit mechanism. 
And as previously alluded to, the content on enzymes actually offers some consolidation of learning around protein structure, as you can link it back to the importance of the tertiary structure already covered. So due to those bonds in the tertiary structure, such as the hydrogen bonds, the ionic bonds, and the disulfide bridges, this results in the further twisting of the 3D shape of the protein forming, in this case, that very specific 3D structure of the active site within enzymes. This then feeds into the two mechanisms of the enzyme action. So in terms of lock and key, quite simply, as we can see on the screen here, the substrate has a shape that is complementary to the active site of the enzyme, allowing it to bind and the reaction to be catalyzed. And then alongside this, you can also cover the second example of the induced fit mechanism, where initial binding of the substrate causes that change in the 3D shape of the active site, making it then complementary to the substrate. That's the level of detail you need to go into these two mechanisms, as no further detail is required by the specification. However, as the overarching learning point talks about catalyzing a wide range of intracellular reactions, you may want to include some examples. A health example would be aromatase that catalyze, catalyzes androgenin hormones into estrogen in women. And as increased estrogen levels can be a risk factor for breast cancer, aromatase inhibitors can be prescribed to lower these levels and therefore lower the risk. This is just one, out, one example out of many that could be used for context. You could even link in the occupational specialisms. So for example, in laboratory science, glycolysis is referenced and you could discuss the importance of the various enzymes that play a role within that 10 reaction process. And then based on the specification, you need to cover the effect of temperature, pH, enzyme and substrate concentration on enzyme controlled reactions. Now you don't have to include the graphs. However, as a personal choice, I always like to when describing the effect of those factors on enzyme activity. This also supports them with developing their general competencies, which David referenced earlier, specifically general mathematical competency eight, communicating using mathematics. As the specification links the, uh, the effect of temperature and pH to the tertiary structure, I would link this into explaining the effect of these two factors on the bonds found within that tertiary structure. So as temperature increases, there is an increased likelihood of a successful collision up to, me, up to the optimum temperature. That can be linked back to B1.39, which covers the principles of collision theory. And then after this point, the enzymes begin to denature as temperature is increased, as the bonds within the tertiary structure break, leading to that loss of shape within the active site. Then in terms of pH, you can link this to how it affects the ionic bonds found within the tertiary structure and hence why there is that very narrow window in terms of an optimum pH. You could link this to specific enzyme examples, such as the proteases found within the stomach. You can then link uh, back enzyme and substrate concentration to the two mechanisms of action covered earlier. For example, if you increase the concentration of enzymes, it will increase the rate of reaction until all the active sites are filled with all the available substrate. Then increasing that enzyme concentration further will have no effect and vice versa with substrate concentration. If you increase the amount of substrate concentration to a point where all the active sites are filled after this point, increasing the substrate concentration further will have no effect. So that's all the information in terms of the level of delivery with reference to proteins. Here are just some examples of recent research and occupationally relevant topics that you can bring into these lessons just to help students understand their importance within their T-level journey. So for the first example, you could talk about the use of Cas9 bacterial proteins in genetics research, a big talking point at the minute with the ability to do some gene editing. This may also lead to some good debates within the classroom that you could then relate back to the A7 topic around ethics. You could link in the effect of mutations on proteins, for example, the CFTR protein mutation within cystic fibrosis and the resulting effect. You could reference protein purification, which is referenced in the laboratory sciences occupational specialism, which could then be further cross-referenced to mass spectrometry, which is featured within B1, as mass spectrometry is used within proteomics to investigate protein structure and protein interactions.
And then if you have any food science students, proteins are also covered in terms of their importance within cell development, where they are found in terms of types of food and also their importance within meat alternatives. Now, as I've been talking for quite a long time now, we're just going to have a little break and look at how we can use the specification to formulate multiple choice questions. Now, when using the specification in this way, we are creating A01 question, A01 questions, which demonstrate that knowledge and understanding of those context, concepts, theories, and principles in science, and which makes up 29% of the marks within core component papers. And so a poll should appear on your screen. And all we need to do is follow that link. Again, a link will be going into the chat as well. And just select any statement out of the list that apply to globular proteins. And a reminder that this has been made using the specification. So see there, enzymes, um, sorry, examples include enzymes and hemoglobin. They're formed of long chains, which are arranged in a variety of coiled shapes. And then there was just that hidden answer at the bottom there, which they have a diversity of potential shapes that reflects the range of functions performed by these proteins, such as binding, signaling, and transport. And I think that one was hidden at the bottom there. We're now also going to just review the Padlet and share some good practice around biological molecules. So please add any ideas you have around the delivery of proteins and enzyme structure. So that first or second column there, and if you have any good sources of information for any or any recent relevant research, please feel free to share these also. And again, I'm just going to give us a minute to go through that. Just give us a little while longer because still people are still typing. Got a comment there, Molly Mod Kits, where learners can practice condensation and hydrolysis reactions. We use the DNA model to break uh, the nucleotides down into the component part so that every learner then helped build the molecule. Brilliant, that will also go in the, the nucleic acids as well. And again, Molly Mod Kits to build a couple of amino acids. I found they could see the condensation reaction better and the formation of a polypeptide chain as well as the 3D structure. Yeah, fantastic. Big fan of Molly Mod Kits. And like I say, allow students to see that 3D structure. Fantastic, thank you. So, yeah, use of those Molly Mod kits to practice those condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions, just so students can see that 3D structure and where the water molecule comes from. Brilliant. I think that's everyone finished typing, so we'll go back now. And we are now going to look at the content the depth of content and delivery ideas for lipids and carbohydrates, as well as answering any questions that you may have as we go through. So as with proteins, carbohydrates are introduced within B1. So with reference to the structure, properties and functions of carbohydrates, students need to be aware that monosaccharides are the monomers from which disaccharides and polysaccharides are built. Then it also gives some examples of common monosaccharides, such as glucose, galactose, and fructose. Then maltose and sucrose are the examples of disaccharides provided as well. As these have been directly mentioned, and the word structure is featured in the main stem of the point, I would feature these structures as examples with students, which I'll show in a couple of minutes. And finally, a polysaccharide is introduced as being formed from many monosaccharide molecules with examples of starch, glycogen, and cellulose. Again, I would feature these examples, especially as they feature in B2, which we can see on the next slide. So as with proteins, carbohydrates is built upon in B2. It's very similar to the B1 content, B1 content, and it goes into more detail about the elements which monosaccharides are composed of, so carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. It then goes into more detail around the condensation reaction, discussing how it forms that glycosidic bond between monosaccharides. It also references how polysaccharides can be made from different isomers of the same monosaccharide or by combination of different monosaccharides. Again, it references starch, glycogen and cellulose. So I would include these as specific examples as shown next. So here is an example 
of two alpha glucose molecules which react to form maltose. The other monosaccharides that are featured in the specification, again, that you would include the structure of, is galactose and fructose. And the other disaccharide mentioned was sucrose, which is comprised of glucose and fructose. You can then use this to show a section of a polysaccharide, in this case, glycogen, showing how a polysaccharide is made up of many repeated monosaccharides bonded together with those glycosidic bonds. To meet that B2 content, again, I've highlighted how this is a condensation reaction, forming the glycosidic bond highlighted in green and the formation of water. Due to condensation being referenced here, this further supports introducing it in the protein section as it's a reaction that keeps coming up. Therefore, going into that level of detail early makes delivery easier as you can cover the rest of the reactions quicker as students will already have that understanding of condensation reactions. To support the understanding of B2.1 specification point around different isomers, I would first introduce alpha and beta glucose as examples of isomers. This will allow students to see that although they have the same molecular formula, they have a different structural formula. Now you can see you don't have to go into level of detail around including the numbering of carbons, nor do students have to remember that it's on carbon one that the position of the hydroxyl group, aka the OH group, is different. However, presenting these structures to the students make sure they have that awareness of what an isomer is and how that can lead to the formation of different polysaccharides. And so using this, uh, you can see how alpha glucose is used to form the branched molecules of glycogen and starch. And then to explain the difference between glycogen and starch, as they are both formed from alpha glucose, you can explain how starch is formed within plants and glycogen is formed within animals as glucose stores. And then you can see beta glucose here forming the straight unbranched chains of cellulose. Both diagrams are provided to highlight the key differences between the structures due to the different isomers of glucose they contain. And again, you can then link this back even further to B1.8 content around how they are large molecules, which are insoluble, which allows them to carry out storage and support functions. So using this diagram, you can talk about how glycogen and starch are used for storage and cellulose is used for the support function within the cell walls of plant cells. Before we move on to lipids, I just want to check to see if any questions have come up into the chat that need answering. Uh, no questions at the moment either, Joe. Uh, and again, we we'll encourage you all, make sure you are putting in those questions. We want to make sure that any queries you have are addressed. Brilliant. Thank you, David. And again, um, so on the next slide, we can see that lipids are covered within B1, with the initial reference to being a diverse group of substances containing hydrogen, carbon and oxygen. It states that they are generally insoluble in water, but that will obviously factor in to when we discuss phospholipids. Phospholipids are introduced as one of the main groups of lipids, along with triglycerides. It also references the main role of phospholipids in the plasma membrane, providing flexibility and transport mechanisms. The other role of lipids involve providing an energy store, insulation and protection. Again, like with proteins and carbohydrates delivery, combining this with B2 content will help support the student's understanding. This can be done at a later stage, but it's always best to refer back to the B1 content or include some of the B2 content here if you can. So similar to proteins and carbohydrates, again within B2, we go into that into more detail around the structure and function of lipids. This includes the structure of triglycerides and phospholipids and how they're formed. Also, there's the introduction of key terms hydrophobic and hydrophilic and how they apply to phospholipids and how this links to the bilayer structure of the membrane. So next, we will look at how we can bring all that information together. So the condensation reaction isn't directly referenced, but again, I would include it um, when talking about the formation of a triglyceride, just to show the structure of all the different components. So start with glycerol and those three fatty acids. The molecule then undergoes condensation reaction to form 
a triglyceride and three molecules of water. I would also introduce the structure of a phospholipid so that they can see that one of the fatty acids has been substituted for a phosphate group. Then highlight the hydrophilic head of the phospholipid due to the phosphate group as well as the hydrophobic tails. For, for context, I would also go into detail around the roles of lipids. So for example, as an energy store, as lipids provide twice the amount of energy as carbohydrates when oxidized, and that actually links in with B2.12 around the comparative amounts of energy produced by different respiratory substrates. So lipids provide more than carbohydrates and proteins. And then as insulation, as fats are poor conductors of heat and therefore help the body stay warm when fat, fat is found under the body surface. And then for protection, as certain organs have fat stored around them to aid with protection, for example, the kidneys. So now the structure of the phospholipid has been covered. This can then be linked to the idea that the phospholipid bilayer is the major component of all biological membranes, providing flexibility and transport mechanisms. As we know, the bilayer is important for the membrane functions, and this can then be linked to the fluid mosaic model, which is referenced within B1.11, which looks at the principles of cellular exchange and transport mechanisms, which exist to facilitate this exchange. So you can link in the phospholipid bilayer with diffusion of small nonpolar molecules, as well as other mechanisms of transport referenced within B1.11, with reference to carrier and channel proteins, which are found within the cell surface membrane. So here are some examples, again, of recent research and occupational relevance. So you could link to the food science occupational specialism for food science students, which focuses on foods that contain carbohydrates. You could also link carbohydrates with previous learning around proteins through glycoproteins. This would link to cell signaling as glycoproteins can be receptors, as well as binding sites for hormones and drugs. For lipids, this can once again be linked to the food science occupational specialism as it describes the functions of lipids and further to the core content, it also includes hormone production you could link lipids in with health and disease. For example, how fats are linked to fatty deposits in the coronary arteries in coronary heart disease. And there's a link to a web page there that refreshes all the time with recent and relevant research around lipids. And again, just as a little break, I provided another example of a formative assessment question. This is a longer answer question, getting students to use the diagrams of the structures of the two isomers of glucose, and then explain how the combination of these isomers can lead to different polysaccharides. So just to make things a bit easier, when accessing the Slido, I presented it as a multiple choice of various statements. Again, if you just click any that apply to this question, but in terms of actual delivery, I'd ask students to write out this answer and then check their understanding using the content from the specification. So the question should appear on the screen now and all you need to do is just to select any of the correct statements that apply to the formation of different polysaccharides and a reminder that this has been made using the specification and I'll just give us a minute and a half to have a go at this. Perfect and if we click on to the next slide it will come up with the correct answers yet yeah, brilliant most people get in the correct answers there so condensation of beta glucose forms cellulose of alpha glucose forms glycogen and starch and glycogen is formed in animals and bacteria whereas starch is formed in plants so again just to even though that was multiple choice i'd get students to write that answer out just to check their understanding from the content from the specification Again, I'm just going to give us a minute just to add any um, ideas onto the Padlet for this section on carbohydrates and lipids. So any good practice or any relevant research you may have, please feel free to share on the Padlet and I'll just give us a minute to access that before moving on to nucleic acids. Yeah, but it's a reference there to teaching in conjunctions with the properties of a phospholipid bilayer. No worries, that was meant to be in, in lipids. 
But you can link in carbohydrates as well, again, linking back to that idea of glycoproteins, which will be found in the phospholipid bilayer. So thinking about those cross links. And I'll just give us 10 more seconds. Okay, I can see someone typing there, but we'll, we'll move on to DNA uh, and then we can review that at the end. So again, oh, there we go. So using that idea that things are taught in conjunction um, with the properties of a phospholipid bilayer linking to lipids. And then again, making those cross links between those different topics. So as we've now gone through examples of how to use the specification to pitch that delivery of biological molecules, um, and based on the time we've got left, I'm just going to go through some quick information around nucleic acids and where they're found within the specification. So here within B1.14, you can see the structure of DNA and RNA is covered with reference to the mechanism of inheritance. Nucleotides and their components are covered to highlight the key differences between RNA and DNA. Again, you can see a condensation reaction is referred to in terms of the formation of the phosphodiester bond. And this again can hopefully now be covered with relative ease as students will now be aware of what a condensation reaction is. So here I've just included um, a simplification of the condensation reaction that forms the phosphodiester bond. You may wish to go into uh, including the specific structures which would support the explain, explaining of complementary base pairing, for example. Um, but that's, uh, that's up to you. You can do it as a simplified version as shown on the screen. But for example, you could use that more detailed uh, structure to show how adenine binds with thymine or uracil as they form two hydrogen bonds and how cytosine bind with guanine to form those three hydrogen bonds. You may also want to include the structure to better highlight the phosphodiester bond itself. And you can also adapt this to highlight the difference between DNA and RNA as instead of pentose, you, uh, you could include deoxyribose for DNA and ribose for RNA. You would then also highlight how uracil is a nitrogen containing organic base found within RNA and thymine is the, a nitrogen containing base, organic base within DNA. And again here we just have two diagrams to help support that understanding of the structure of nucleic acids. So DNA being that double helix containing the nitrogen containing organic bases adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine, whereas RNA is a relatively short single-stranded polynucleotide chain and contains uracil instead of thymine. Nucleic acids come up again in B2 with a similar level of detail to B1 in terms of structure. However, it does go into more detail about the role of DNA bases in the production of amino acids and protein, th in protein synthesis. It also discusses how the DNA sequence is universal, non-overlapping, and degenerate. So universal meaning that codons code for the same amino acids in all organisms, degenerate meaning that amino acids are coded for by more than one codon, and non-overlapping that each codon is read individually. How the sequence of bases code for the polypeptide with the inclusion of codons, a set of three bases is also included. And bringing all this together into the pro process of protein synthesis, will meet B2.3, with a simplified diagram provided here as reference, but this will then also help consolidate all the learning around the structures of nucleic acids and proteins. And before we move on to a final review of the Padlet, I'm just going to check to see if there's any questions that need answering. Uh, none so far that, we, that haven't been addressed, so no questions at the moment. Thanks, David. If there are any, as we're doing this uh, final review of the Padlet, please do share um, and we'll answer. And like I say, we're now going to do a final review of the Padlet and share some good practice around biological molecules. Again, please add any ideas that you have around the delivery of nucleic acid. I know it's been a very whistle-stop tour, or if you've got any more ideas for the other columns, please feel free to add those also. And I'll just give us a couple of minutes. As always, any issues with accessing the Padlet, please do let us know.
So I had a point there. So continual reminders of the bonds between all the molecules is essential as uh, students can get very confused. Absolutely. Consistently going back and embedding those different types of bond found within the different types of structures. So yeah, we went through the steps and the students then had to create a flow chart of the processes of transcription and translation. And then we used a code on table to create a protein which worked well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and then again, linking back to that first point, continual reminders of all the bonds between all the molecules is essential. Kids get very confused. Um, also working backwards with that code on table is always fun. So um, having students have a base, they have to figure out the codons, then have to figure out the amino acids. They then have to build their own protein, make it into a bit of a competition between students who can build their protein first. Can they get the correct amino acid sequence? Um, always a fun way of delivering that process. Um, I'm now going to hand back over to David just for the final polling. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for that, Joe, and all that information. So I've just come to the end of this now, so I just want to end with uh, the same question I sort of asked at the very beginning in the poll, your confidence level with the delivery of biological molecules. How are you feeling now after uh, Joe's gone through some of this? Um, you had a chance to share ideas and so on. Again, with one being little to no confidence and a 10 being uh, very confident. Uh, about a third of the votes in already. Well, I'll get them straight away. Um, some increases in confidence. Okay. Oh, it looks like we got um, all votes in. Uh, I will want to pick up on one of them definitely. Uh, so, seven to eight nine to ten so 66 percent in that higher sort of bracket range uh one to two for some remember please put the questions that you have if there's something you're still not sure about we need to know we want to make sure you're supported that you have the information you need anything that you need assistance with that is what we're here for so please put those questions those who are especially those who are in the one to two bit please pop them into the question box but I'm glad to see that we have a lot more people in the higher end uh, compared to the start, which is excellent. Um, do put those questions in now as well, Anyone, any final questions that you do have, because we will be remaining on here for the remaining five minutes or so that's left. Uh, but if you are leaving now, please do, uh, and um, hope you found this useful. There will be a little evaluation that pops up at the end. If you, We'd really appreciate you uh, filling that out with your feedback. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, then my very much thanks to Joe and from everyone here at NCFE, we would like to wish you a very safe and successful year. Okay, uh, one quick, oh, okay, so yeah, I can understand what you're saying. So one comment just in, there's not much we can do about this, unfortunately, uh, that you believe this uh, is just beyond your abilities and really need a science teacher to deliver. Well, this is, remember, this is for the science T level, only the content within B1, um, because I'm assuming uh, you uh, deliver health, judging by that comment. Uh, remember the B1 elements, everything in B1 is common to health. This contained B1 and B2, and B2 content that Joe also mentioned, that's unique to the science T level. So some of that other higher level detail that would only appear on the science T level. Uh, and Dan, I'm just going to have a look at the Padlet. Uh, Dan's adding a sequencing suggestion in the Padlet. Ah, yes, you are delivering health. Okay, so that so that earlier question, yeah. So do we care? So all of this webinar, it is a science T-level webinar. So not everything that was talked about here, content-wise and delivery-wise, is not all 100% applicable to health. So if you thought everything that was covered here was applicable equally to health, it's not, because this is science. This is a science T-level webinar. Some of the content on B1 that Joe talked about, yes, that's relevant for health, but not the B2. So I'll just uh, show the Padlet again. Oh, sequencing this bit here, I'm assuming here. Teach molecules in B1 before digestion in B2 and transport mechanisms in B1.
So that's for the health spec, yeah. Okay, yeah, I thought it might have been the sequencing bit then. And if there's any other questions, uh, do please uh, pop them in. Like I said, if not, we do appreciate uh, that evaluation. I'll pop at the end uh, being filled in. Feedback is valuable to us.